interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, by air, President Roosevelt has just announced. The attack also was made on all naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. It was a Sunday. Uh, I was 17 and a half years old. And on weekends, uh, the guys, a lot of guys would show up to play basketball. There was a candy store across, we call it a candy store, it was across the street from the playground. Uh, they, uh, you know, sold candy and tobacco, or whatever. And they had a radio going all the time, and somebody yelled that the Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor, and nobody knew where Pearl Harbor was. And eventually, from the, I guess, radio broadcast, they said it's a Japanese naval, it's an American naval base in Hawaii. So, of course, we knew that we were at war. The White House is now giving out a statement. The attack apparently was made on all naval and on naval and military activities on the principal island of Oahu. And uh, one of the things that I'm proud of to this day is that, you know, that these were guys between 17 and 19 years of age that used to hang around on a weekend to play basketball. And uh, almost all of them volunteered to go into the service. Uh, as it turns out, the, uh, they had what they called an aviation cadet program, which you had to volunteer for. In order to get into that program, you had to pass a very tough physical, as tough as they could think of. And then you also had to pass a written exam. So I wasn't called until after my 18th birthday, which was in May of uh, 42. But they sent me to, uh, to Texas. I went to San Antonio. I asked for pilot training, and I was lucky to get assigned to it. So I went to uh, Cuero, Texas. It's a little town in the middle of Texas for uh, what they called uh, primary training. All the instructors were civilian. A fellow named Gormley was my instructor. I would surprise myself because I remembered his name. And um, we flew a PT-19, which was a, um, a plane made by Fairchild. It had two open cockpits, one behind the other. And I remember uh, the first time he took me up. I'll never forget that. But well, we got up to about 2,000 feet, and he turned the plane upside down. And uh, so, uh, you know, totally unexpected. I'm looking down at the ground. But, uh, and then eventually right at the plane, we came down. And I found out that all the instructors did that. And they did it. They wanted to find out if you get, if you get air sick. And if you got air sick, you were washed out. So uh, and you could see every once in a while they were cleaning out the back of the cockpit of one of the uh, one of the PT-19. That lasted a couple of months, and then from there I went to um, McAllen, Texas, for advanced training, the final stop. Uh, we flew AT-6s made by North American. Pretty well-known plane, and it's pretty much the same, you know. You just advanced into more comp. It was at there where I learned how to fly in formation, and I learned aerobatics, how to you know make rolls and loops and stuff like that. You begin to think that you are special, which is healthy because you do have to have a lot of confidence in yourself. Without that you really can't do the job. You got to, you, you, the last thing in the world in your mind is any fear that you can't handle the job. That's, that's unacceptable. When you got your wings, when you graduated and became an officer, uh, at that time, they asked you what you prefer to, would you prefer to fly a bomber? Would you want, fly a, want to prefer fly? fighter plane training. Uh, they also asked you which theater of operations you preferred to go to. 
But it, that was a little early for people to answer that question. I asked for a fighter plane pilot, and I was lucky. I, I was lucky I got everything I ever asked for. And I went to San Bernardino, and the first fighter that I flew was a P-39, a Bell Ara Cobra. It was no longer being used in combat. It uh, was a pretty unstable plane. It was a good plane for uh, attacking targets on the ground, but as far as uh, aerial combat, it stunk. I think everybody that ever flew one would tell you the same thing. So from there, I went to Wachico. And they had a P-38 training program. And that's where you learn how to fly. That's, uh, you think you know how to fly, but when you, <laughs> when you get in a real fighter, it's a very complicated plane uh, because it had two engines and a lot more to learn. And I remember that, you know, you have to pass a blindfold test. You sit in the, you sit in the cockpit with a blindfold. And there's an instructor that's standing on the wing looking in there, and he says, okay, where is the switch for so-and-so? You have to have a mental picture of the entire cockpit. And you have to be able to put your hand on every switch or any dial or any handle or whatever it was with that blindfold on before you could solo. So I left about, I think it was March or April of 45, and I went to New Guinea. Not yet, New Guinea. And uh, I was there. I flew. They called it a mission, combat mission. We strafed some Japanese. The, the, the war in New Guinea was over by then. You know, the Australians had defeated the Japanese with the help of the Army Air Corps. There were some Japanese. We flew a mission from Nadzap to Wewak, New Guinea. There were Japanese that were holding. You know, the Japanese were pretty tough combatants. They didn't like to surrender. A lot of them never did. So uh, you know, uh, these were Japanese who either they didn't know the war in New Guinea was over, or they just refused to surrender. But they were holed up in this isolated part of the jungle. And we strafed them. They were on the beach. Uh, and I guess they must have been fishing for food or whatever the heck that. But we strafed them. And uh, I, that's the first time I ever shot my gun, what they did. They were cowards. That, Pearl, that attack, sneak attack, was cowardly. And they deserved whatever they got. I don't feel that way about them today. As a matter of fact, when I became, I was part of the occupation forces, I, be, I be learned to respect them a great deal. My attitude changed. But at that time, to answer your question, there was nothing but hatred. They deserved whatever they got. And then I was finally assigned to the 80th Fighter Squadron, Headhunters, who at that time were located based in the Philippines. And I think I got there, I think it was like May of 45. And the war in the Philippines was, was almost over. Most of the missions, I didn't go on any missions, but most of the missions were supporting the infantry on the ground. They dropped uh, napalm. The, uh, the Japanese used, used snipers. They would have them up in the trees. And the infantry in, in heavy jungle had a really tough time advancing. So if you came in with napalm, <laughs> you would clearly, it was no longer jungle. But anyway, the, uh, the uh, new assignment was to move the squadron up to Okinawa. The battle in Okinawa, which is probably the bloodiest battle of the war in the Pacific. So anyway, uh, we finally uh, arrived in Aishima. And uh, by that time, the war was almost over. It was in July of 45. The atomic bombs, the two bombs were dropped in August. 
But the Japanese didn't surrender until August 15th. So between the 9th and the 15th, there were still combat missions. The reason that sticks in my mind, or anyone that was in the squadron, because on August 12th was the last mission, the squadron. The missions were all uh, to Japan to prepare for the invasion. And so the, the missions that my squadron were, were assigned were destroying targets on the ground. But you could figure out, and you, and you knew that you were preparing for the invasion. They told you that. They didn't tell you when it was going to be, but you knew. So uh, you could figure, because the missions were either destroying bridges or destroying railroad infrastructure. The reason that the August 12th, that last mission, stays with everybody in the squadron is our CEO got killed on that last mission. He was hit uh, and uh, went into the, uh, into the ocean. So his name was Bob Hockley. He was a hell of a nice guy. And that uh, it was hard for everybody. And that, here it is, damn war is over. A lot of my most vivid experiences were part in the occupation of Japan. I was part of the occupation forces. We moved our squadron to Japan in November, actually the same time when we were supposed to invade. But what happened when we arrived is something I'll never forget. So our flight leader decided that he's going to get down real low. We got down pretty low over the runway and we you know, peeled off, went around, came in and landed. And you get to the end of the runway, there was a place you could turn off the runway. And then there was a taxi strip that went all the way down the length of the runway to where the planes were parked. But off to the right was this fence. 60, 70 feet from the, you could see this enormous crowd of people on the other side of the fence. And when you looked over at them, they all, it was as though there was a conductor. The entire mass of people bowed. You know the Japanese tradition of respect and welcome? It was an unbelievable experience. This huge crowd of people welcoming him to Japan or whatever they held they were saying. The other thing that I remember, which bothers me even to this day, is about uh, oh, four months or so after we dropped the bomb on Nagasaki, I had an opportunity to fly over Nagasaki. Nagasaki is in Kyushu, western part of Kyushu. And I was down about 200 feet above the ground. And there wasn't a sign of life, of any kind of life. And, you know, and I think that bomb was like a Model T Ford compared to the bombs we have today. So, you know, I have become anti-nuclear weapon. I think, in, and today, we have a situation in which we're so polarized we can't do anything. But if America faced the same situation we faced on December 7th. That would all disappear. All disappear and American people would unite together overnight. So it happened on our watch. But that, so we did what we were supposed to do. And no, I, I don't think, I think it was, a, it was obviously a long, tough, tough struggle, but uh, I think it, every generation would do the same thing.